Hello everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Well, Heartbeat Alaska continues to march around the world. Soon we will be offered in the Scandinavian countries of Sweden, Finland, and Norway with subtitles. Isn't that exciting? Here in America, Heartbeat Alaska will be soon offered nationally Heartbeat on Radio. You'll be able to hear us on K Kiwanik Broadcast here in Anchorage, Alaska. If you are watching from other states, check with the National Public Radio for schedules to pull down Heartbeat Alaska and air it over your radio station. On today's program, we travel to Athabascan country to Venati. I have some very good friends in Venati. It's a fabulous village. We'll learn about the history of that village. We'll go bear hunting and run the rivers with the first chief. It's a great show. I'll be back with Venati right after this. Hello from Venati. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coastal Villages Region Fund. Thank you, CVRF, for your support of Heartbeat Alaska. And by the Nature Conservancy of Alaska, working with Alaska's rural communities to conserve and protect our natural heritage. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. This week's show also brought to you by Wright's Air Service. Thank you, Wright's Air Service, for getting us to be a time back home safe and sound. Welcome back. Venati, Alaska is home to some very good friends of mine. One of them's name is Gary Simple. He invited us out to a duck hunting camp. Things got a little exciting when they had an unexpected visitor. Alaska, you know, tribal tribal land, you know, the Vinitai tribal government. This call, that's where we're at. This, this is Big Lake. That's where I grew up. When I was growing up, we used to have camp all the way around, and right here, all, all these points, they have camps. A long time ago, when they used to have fish and stuff like that in it, and. Uh, and since they put on the road, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dirt road and four-wheeler and all that sort of people will usually stay. They used to live around here for ducks and dried ducks and stuff like that. Since they got a freezer and stuff like that, they don't need to do that, so they could just shoot ducks and just take it home from the freezer. This is Gary Simple. His story is the story of Benatai. It's a story of a people who cannot be separated from their land. The Gwich'in people used to be nomadic, moving with the seasons, living with the rhythm of the animals they used for subsistence. Over the past hundred years, the trappings of modern life have led to more and more time spent in the village and less and less out here. Now Gary's family, is one of the few that still come and camp out here on Big Lake. In the village, people have a lot of life like that, you know, and it's hard to live all this life, you know. You, you, you have to live, uh, you have a life of 
European Indian, uh, and then you, you got to live in, uh, in, in today's society, and then, and, and, and then there's drinking life, and there's drugs life, and there's gambling life, and, and there's lying life, and gossip life, and you, you had to deal with all that, you know. But when you go out here and you come out here, man, you only got to live one life. It's really a place where you get where you get close to your to your to your husband or to your wife or to your kids and, and to the nature of what God had made in the place. That nature is what sets Venati apart. When the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act passed in 1971, the native village of Venati wouldn't take money. All they wanted was their land. 1.8 million acres of pristine wilderness. It's an area about the size of Rhode Island and Delaware put together. The land is owned in common by all through the native village of Venati tribal government. This includes the villages of Venati and Arctic Village. The land allows Gary to raise his kids the same way he was raised. It took, took us out and that's what I remember and that's what I want to do with my kids, you know, instead of them watching TV and video and just running around wild, you know, and, and up not listening to their parents because they're independent, you know, they, they don't depend on anyone. So, you know, I, I encourage uh, parents to take their kids out in the woods. It, it's a good life out there, slow, but it's okay, you know, and it's peaceful, you know, the, the, the creation just overtakes you. This all overtakes you. And you find peace and wonderful, you know, you feel that one. You sleep real good, nice fresh air, you know. Gary's son Gabe is learning to use the kayak that Gary made by hand. I think I made it like six years ago or something like that. So, uh, uh, this is a second canvas I, that I put on. It kind of wear out after a while. But he wants to learn and I think he's ready. He's been around it all his life and you know, and he's been in a canoe with me, and, and I got another son who's, uh, who's 13, <laughs> that will be learning how to shoot inside a canoe, sitting inside a canoe and shoot. He learned, he learned how to do that. Knowing how to shoot is especially important when unwanted guests stop by camp. She saw him right over there. That little girl just went back to use the bathroom too, only 15 yeah, minutes before that. When we came back yesterday, me and my son, and our tent was down, tore down, you know, he just tore it down. He took out the box and uh, and stole our rose, rose piece moose that we were going to and stuff like that, and we know he's around, so we went to sleep, and, and at night we, we, we could hear him walking back there, running around. So it, today, uh, they saw him, they say, they, they try to scare him away, but he just sat back there, he says, so, you know, we don't want that kind of bear around, you know. Gary's mom and his wife had to chase away a black bear earlier by clapping and yelling. Yeah. Every year, uh, since I remember, since I was a kid, as long as I remember, a black bear is always part of uh, duck hunting excitement. Then, just as dinner is almost ready, there's a movement in the trees. When I first shot it, uh, I, I shot him around the bris area, you know, and he turned around and started running. I thought I missed it, so I, so I, so I shot behind him. I shot behind him. That's when I hit him. When I, sh when I shot behind him, he flipped over and he took off. Uh, and you, and me and you, we, we could hear him hollering back there, so we went back there, found him, and shot him again. Make sure, you know, make, make sure that he's dead. Once he's sure the bear is dead, Dad returns to a hero's welcome back at camp. Got him? Yeah. He's dead? Yep, he's dead. And the kids are excited to see the bear and learn from Dad. Wait, not yet. Wait for me, yeah? But actually, it's Dad that's going to be learning. He's never had to skin a bear before. Dad, do you know how to skin a bear? He's learning right now. He's learning right now.
Give him that one beer that we saw over there by all of that camp that uh, got killed. Yeah. And that beer is a bomb beer. It's a bomb beer, though. <laughs> uh, this is a nice beer, I see. Soon enough, though, Gary has the bear cut up into manageable chunks. Well, I'm just packing it up to uh, so my son can pack it down in, in the pack wood. See? Have you, Gabe? Oh, no. How's it, Gabe? It's good. Now he can pack it back down. And then my little girl, like, you know, to, to run around. And I don't want my kids to get real scared, you know. And when they do that, they become afraid of the woods. Mostly my girl will do that, you know. Tell me what you got there. 30-30. Bullet. It went through, but it stopped and went like that. People out here don't usually eat beer, but I do. You know, I I, I love beer. Yeah, I'm going to take the meat in, see see if they, uh, if they want to cook it for pot last tomorrow or whatever they want to do with it. And I, I took only a ham. So I'm going to smoke that and, and cook and fry it up a bit. Yeah, we always share what we have all the time, ducks, moose, whatever we can, you know. Awesome. We, we kind of figure out who, who don't have stuff and, and who don't have hunters living with them and stuff like that. And we usually share with those people like that, you know. As the sun sinks low over Big Lake, it's finally time for dinner. And time for stories around the family fire. It's really good to bring your kids out in the woods because this is where they learn to depend on you instead of depending on themselves. Because when when kids only stay in the village, they de they don't depend on their family. I mean, their mom and dad no more. They just run around wild and do anything they want because you know the village is there. You know, so they feel so safe. So, so I, I I encourage people to take their kids out of the woods where the kids learn how to depend on their dad and their mom for survival out there, you know. So they could, uh, and then when they could, when they could go home, they, they could experience that, you know, and, and parents would have a chance to talk with their kids uh, out here, tell a story about, uh, about when, when your kids, and their kids would love that, you know. They love your story, you know, instead of hearing, war story and rated R movie and stuff like that, they could listen to you, you know, and, and build a related relationship between you and your kids, you know, out, out here. It's wonderful because nothing is in interference. You know? And that's wonderful for me. <laughs> Lisa Zam with Alaska Family Hospice, your home in the city. We would like to invite you to stay with Alaska Family, located right next to the Alaska Native Medical Center. We will have a new addition for our special prenatal guests, a beautiful prenatal home. Call to make your reservations. This fall and winter, every guest is entered in a very special drawing every week for gift certificates, and in December, a grand drawing. So the next time you're coming to Anchorage, stay with Alaska Family, your home in the city. I'm a woman, I'm native, and I vote. And I don't leave it to others to tell me what matters. To me, every issue is a woman's issue. Every issue is a native issue. Whatever your issue is, be heard. No boxes, no masks. 
I am Alaska. You are Alaska. Vote. Welcome back. Let's jig on into the village for a potlatch. The Dinakanaga Elders and Youth Conference brought a lot of new faces into Vena time. And there is no better way to get acquainted with new friends than a fiddle dance. It's a toe-tapping good time for everybody, even if you're not sure which foot is which. Then, just as the dance is in full swing, the first chief of Venati, Bobby Tritt, gets some news. He hears of a boat that is stranded about 16 miles downriver from Venati. Quickly, he puts away his base and gets to work putting together a rescue party to go check on them. With some extra gas, a little food, hey -ho, hey -ho. and a lot of good cheer, Bobby and Ernest hey Eric shove off from Venatai hey at 3.30 hey a.m. Oh, it's singing medicine music. Make sure they're okay. Hey -ho, hey -ho. Hey -ho, hey -ho. The Chandelar is a tricky river, fast, winding, and shallow. It's easy to run aground or get stuck in snags. The combination of cold meltwater and fast current means the river can quickly turn deadly. Luckily, both Bobby and Ernest have been running this river all their lives. They know its curves and currents, in the same way a big city cab driver knows which streets to take across town. But then, at 5 a.m., and a few miles short of the stranded boat, There's engine trouble. Bobby and Ernest find themselves adrift in the fast current. After a lot of head scratching and checking the spark plugs, it's clear the engine is done for. Out here, there is no radio, no phone, just 1.8 million acres of wilderness. Ernest and Bobby take stock of the food they have. It'll be several hours before anyone in the village realizes they are overdue. So Bobby and Ernest quickly get down to doing the best thing they can think of, sleeping. John here. The way it looks like no. Oh. I don't know. You can't tell less quick, but I look like John Eric Jr. He's from uh, uh he's got him and the Eric boys, they got cabin down here in the lower mouth of uh Chandler River. It turns out to be John Eric. John is taking an elder back to Fort Yukon. 
Fort Yukon is the closest village to Venatai, but that's still several hours away, even with a fast skip. Because of his concerns for the elder, John continues on to Fort Yukon, but promises to phone back to Venatai as soon as he gets there. He has to take the elder back over to Fort Yukon, so that's the reason why he's going east from here. So by two hours from now, we should have a boat. He knows Bobby and Ernest will have no problem surviving. This is their home after all. Now we'll check out that island for rabbits if we have to. After five more hours under the sun that never goes away, the boys hear another skiff coming. It's Lance Whitwell. The three decide to continue downriver to look for the stranded boat. We go down and rescue the rest of the people here. At 7.30 p.m., they hit the Yukon River, leaving Venatai's tribal lands and Bobby's jurisdiction as chief. There was no sign of the boat that was stranded. They decided to head two hours upriver to Fort Yukon to get more fuel and supplies for the return to Venatai. In Fort Yukon, they find John Eric again, who tells them the people who were stranded were able to fix their boat and get back underway, and so they didn't need to be rescued after all. How do you knock it in? After a stop in town to call home. What'd your wife have to say? Oh, like, we're happy and she's safe and uh. She knows that we we're safe, but we just didn't get the message right that those other guys' uh, boat is okay. They're heading back down to their home, but we didn't get the word, so we end up here. The boys returned to the river, positive that they did the right thing, despite all the problems along the way. I think we've done our job from giving up our time and stuff like this for this kind of stuff, and this is what we do in a rural area. Anybody that uh, needs help, or in a rescue, as voluntarily, we go out, no matter who you are, chief, teacher, advisor, tribe, you know, this is part of our, our people done it for many years. We always give, you know, no matter what it is, money, food, clothing, you know, it's, uh, it pays back in the long term. I don't know, it's Friday night, but we're going back to Vinitai. I don't know what time it is now, but sometime around midnight, I guess. But uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be back to Vinitai. What do you think, Lance? About six in the morning. Hours? Six in the morning. Oh, six o'clock in the morning. About six, seven o'clock in the morning. After almost 30 hours on the water, the boys arrive back home. They are tired, but feel lucky to once again be able to see so much of the land, the land that sets Venatai apart.
Hi, my name is Johnny Albertson from Fort Yukon. Hi, I'm Vincent Keller from Fort Yukon and Heartbeat Alaska. We'll be right back. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Nuxet. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Thank you everyone from being a tie and Wright's Air Service for your help in this story. Wright's Air Service, God is out to be in a time. We sure appreciate you people. They're located in Fairbanks, Alaska. Jump on their plane next time you're in that area. And thank all of you for joining us before we leave. We want to hear some more of that great Athabascan fiddle music. So here it is. God bless every single one of you. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>